Okay, so in the previous lecture, video lecture, I asked you that question, how to make a better work and what were the best traits that you will put in the new generations? How do you make the perfect Canadian? And uh, you know, that is very difficult, a very difficult answer. But what Galton thought is, you know, what about if we take all these best traits of all the best people, of all the things that we love, and we promote that these people have children, and as we marry these people, we avoid that they dilute those best traits. And that was very controversial. So he was trying to make a better word. And if you remember the examples of the corn and the examples of the artificial selection of the corn and of the different type of animals, he said, why we don't do the same thing with humans? And although it was... Um, novel idea uh, let's say in the beginning it uh, create uh, terrible consequences and actually those ideas unfortunately were used by politicians as i will show you and in the end up even in the generating the second world war so let's talk about that so we're going to talk now in this section about social darwinism so Dar Galton was very interested in applying the ideas of Darwin into human evolution. And as we watch in the video, I want that you remember the examples of twins. I want that you remember, and I will show you videos about the anthropomorphic lab, that that was something very positive. This is how human genetics start. And later we will talk about the problems of Galton's work. That, I, as we talked multiple times, is eugenic. So let's start talking about twins. So in the Victorian era, and in particular Galton, although there was not invented the word even genetics, and we didn't know where the genes were located, the idea is that that school of thought considered that being smart are an honor phenotypic traits, they have a huge influence of nature while the environment play a very low influence so for example a tra phenotypic trait like a being a smart like eminence for galton it was due to heredity mainly not to the environment so he then thought that maybe the people that was not very smart it was because if they he, they didn't have the proper education or they or there was a correlation between the socio-economical conditions and the intelligence. So, and more than uh, doing this on purpose, he was just biased because, as I said, of, of his uh, of his family and the hierarchical organization of the British society of the Victorian era. So, to summarize, Galton have a very deterministic view of genetics. So, and as we watch in the video, so he thought that that the characteristics in biology they must be shaped by genes rather than the environment or experience. And this is something very characteristic of this Western school of thought. And as I said before, he said, okay, now all that Darwin have explained. What is are the implications for our society? And Galton's ideas start diverging from the ideas of Darwin. And one example of that is the study of twins. And the study of twins that Galton had clearly showed the personality of Galton. So uh, first, he was a pioneer in, on a field that he was the first one who studied, who did the study of twins to measure the relatively strengths of heredity and environment. So when he studied twins, he started comparing these two factors, heredity and environment. But how he did it? He did it in a very systematic way. So he, something good of his study is, is that he collected a lot of data and he was able to compare it. And the idea of his studies was to establish how far similarities and differences between twins were affected by their life experience. And you know that in that case, twins are a great example 
because we can clearly see what happened in the environment, what is the results of the environment, and what is the results of the genes. Of course, he still didn't know what was a gene, he still didn't know so many things, but, but it was a, a good beginning, a good beginning to human genetics. And as we watch in the video, he started one of these debates between nature and nurture that are very common in psychology and in biology. And nature in biology will be genes. Well, and nurture will be the environment in biology. So he was trying to say, he tried to see if nature was more important, genes were more important, or the environment was more important. In his case, he found that nature was more important. So he, and to finish this idea of twins, of the work of Galton, I just want to tell you that, um, that his work on twins was helping to explore the idea of acquired inheritance. And he found that he rejected the idea of acquiring inheritance using twins because, as he said, we talked just in the previous slide, the environment, in his case, he didn't play a key role. So independent of the environment where the twins were located, they, they will have the major influence will be the nature, the genes not the environment. So he rejects the idea of the acquire characteristics and in contrast, yeah, he argued that the hereditary material was exclusively stored in reproductive organs and those ones were isolated from the effect of the environment. And to some degree, this is, uh, this is true. Although, as we have talked before, the environment in the last decades, this idea of the importance of the environment has increased. And now we know that depending on the trait, some, uh, the environment can play a, bit, uh, a, more, a much important role than in other cases. Okay, so now we just finished talking about the twins, the debate between nature and nurture, and if I ask you in a test, I want that you tell me that for him, nature was very important, while the environment, the nurture was less important. And how he studied that? Study by a study twins. And using that, he reject the idea of acquired traits. Now I want that we talk about the anthropomorphic lab that it was, uh, again, in the same way that the study of twins was very important, then the study of anthropomorphic lab, it was the beginning of human genetics. And uh, to move into the anthropomorphic lab, Galton was so interested in statistics that he saw uh, biological traits as data points that it was uh, very revolutionary for that time. So if you remember these experiments, with a Galton used a sweet piece to measure different traits. And he was very interested in, on, on this type of behavior that they always have this bell curve. So he was interested in why do you find always that there is an average and what is the implication into, into other traits, yeah? So, so he didn't know why but he found that traits follow a normal distribution. And I'm going to show you a video that talk about the importance of his work and the importance in particular of these normal distributions. Again, in this video, we will talk about another of the applications uh, of Galton's work. And this is very particular, very interesting because it's not only a, a, has an application in genetics, but also has an application in finance and they will show you a very interesting machine that he created. So I hope that you enjoyed this video too. One of the most important concepts for investors to understand is reversion to the mean. It's also widely used in statistics. The phenomenon was first observed by Francis Galton in the early 1870s. 
And this is the machine he designed himself to illustrate it, variously called the Galton Board, Probability Machine or Quickunx. It has got his handwriting on it. Um, and his handwriting is a, a set of handy instructions as to how to use the device. We have to turn it topsy-turvy, as he said. As I let it go, all the little ball bearings feed through the funnel and they're channeled through the, the quincux pattern of nails and there at the bottom, every time you do it, you get the normal distribution of the bell-shaped curve. So why the bell-shaped curve? Well, it's all to do with what mathematicians call binomial distribution. For every single one of the balls, whenever it hits one of the pins, it's got a 50-50 chance of going one way or the other. And what the device demonstrates is that the odds of one of the ball bearings hitting pins and constantly going to the right, for example here, is considerably less than the odds of it travelling and coming into the middle. Why Galton was interested in this was because he wanted to understand about the laws of heredity and how traits are passed from parents to their children. This bell-shaped curve became rather iconic when a Belgian statistician called Adolphe de Quetelet observed that if you measured for an individual trait within a population, you always got the bell-shaped curve. Investment author Mark Hebner believes Galton's machine is an excellent way of illustrating stock market returns, so much so that he commissioned a large replica which takes pride of place in the office of his firm, Index Fund Advisors, in Irvine, California. One of the results that's really interesting is going forward, you should anticipate about half of those returns being greater than the average expected return and half being less than those returns. And the further your return ends up being from the average, the less likely it is to occur. Now that you watched that video, now I'm going to show you another binding, another approach that it was very important that actually start the field of human genetics and is this obsession of Galton for counting and quantifying things. And is the anthropometric lab. So he was obsessed with see difference between humans, but it's not wrong, yeah? So for example, he tried to look for difference between cultural groups and between people uh, within a culture. So for example, he started trying to measure the skull, how big they were the skulls, what was the curvature of the skull, the type of the color of the hair, the color of the eye, the time of reaction. They see something, how fast you react to those changes, and he started trying to quantify those things, what is actually very useful. So remember, his goal was to evaluate the difference between humans using precise measurement. And this uh, start the field of uh, psychometric, which is defined as the application of statistics to measure individual reference with reference to uh, behavioral variables. However, there was a problem with this. All these measurements, so for example, to have a small or a big head, it doesn't mean that you are, or to have a shape of, a, of the skull in a in certain way, that it was something that it was, actually we lived for uh, for decades uh, it doesn't affect the intelligence uh, what actually affects the intelligence is more the connection between your neurons is to have a specific genes and actually to be honest with you we are still working on what is intelligence and we are still working on, on a lot of things so although quantifi quantifying was correct the analysis and the implications that he found were not correct because nobody at that time knew what, what the, the shape of, of a skull it doesn't mean that you're more intelligent or less intelligent. There were other traits that they were more important to determine if somebody's intelligent or not, and we are still working on that. And here there is a picture of the Galton's lab and all the inventions that he created and actually he showed that in an exhibition and he started asking people for money so he measured he did a start of measuring uh, the skull of the people the shapes of the skull the fingerprints a lot of things he started charging for that so people found that very interesting and in that way he collected money to do more experiments so remember he introduced the anthropometric labs in 1884, I will not ask the date, 
and he show all the equipment of his own invention and in that way he start men testing mental uh, abilities and he start collecting difference between each people that he that and that were taking those tests again although the data was correct it was wonderful to have that data the the analysis that he had they were not he didn't have the basis to to make connection between the thing that he quantified and intelligence and again as i said before he was the one who started having these fingerprints and he found that uh, they were a good way to differentiate between people and i'm going to show you some example of the measurement that he did so he measured for example uh, the body measurements and the muscular strength he also measured the sensory capacity and in this way uh, he determined if somebody was more intelligent or another one and how he did it he discriminated between different intervals of pitch so how fast somebody can perceive some pitches um, and also the reaction time and uh, i will ask this in the test again the name of this book and the, what he implied in this book he found two main findings one that the behavioral and mental traits could be inherited what is partially true and the difference between individuals could be measured what could be partially true however in the way that he did it it was not correct so but it was a good beginning to start analyzing difference in the intelligence and morphometrical difference in, in humans however there was no connection between the difference that he analyzed and the and the intelligence and as a result he concluded uh, that outstanding ability can be inherited later i will show you some ways in which these things uh, went really wrong and this was one of the type of proof that he showed in, for his argument he select men of outstanding ability and he looked at the frequency of success among the relatives so for example 30 percent of illustrious fathers in those cases they have 48 percent of having an eminent sons so if your father he considered that his fathers were very smart their kids will also be it's very likely that they will be very smart now i'm going to move in uh, the problems of galton's work that of course it was this that we already talked to eugenics so one of the problems is galton's use a restricted sample for him for example he never include women because at that time there was a bias uh, for gender and not only that class was very important and he never include businessmen from industry or, and or commerce he only include people that he was related to the queen or people that they was very rich because of uh, his position in the society so he overemphasized heredity factors under uh, environmental factors as we have previously said during, talked during this lecture and i just remind you that education was compulsory in 1880 in england so in the time that galton lives many people didn't have any education on the profession your professional career will depend mainly on on your connections so if you were brother or you knew somebody that it was related to the queen or related to somebody famous you will be able to have not only a better education to a better place for entry jobs so he then took that into account and this also buys his data now i'm going to stop in this section i'm going to uh, talk a little bit in the class more and i'm going to show you how this eugenics was took by politicians and how those politicians end up turning these scientific ideas in something really bad and hopefully we can have a nice discussion and about the importance of science and discoveries and how they should be communicated to the society